Uh, I'll be just taking questions from the floor. So whoever's got a question, just put your hand up. And I'll show you how to speak as well. to answer Magda. As for the hijab, obviously, as I said, um, there's a combination between the first two material and the third one, which is the taqwa. What happens is, in the material hijab, taqwa is like intertwined. So what happens is that as you develop in your understanding of hijab, you move, for example, from the... If I was to say movement in hijab, I would say you move from the jacket and jeans, all right, and you move on towards maybe something a bit more... You know, it looks a bit more uh, modest until eventually, eventually, if, if this is what you feel brings you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're even willing to cover your face. It is not uh, wajib uh, to cover the face. Although you will even find, as the sister mentioned, Dubai. Those of you who have been to the Emirates, I'm telling you, you you're going to see the, the niqab there. Sometimes the eyes do more talking than anything else, true? Now, what I was doing looking at their eyes is another question, but the fact is that the... <laughs> The, the eyes in the shopping center, actually, that the niqab is like this. And you've got these eyes full of the mascara and the estelado, the whole section is thrown into the eyes, yeah? So like they sometimes do more talking than anything else. So it's not necessary that uh, the person who's covered her face, she may be just the type of um, Muslim girl who attends the mosque in Muharram and Ramadan. The rest of the year, she's non-existent. Wafat al-Jawad, what's Wafat al-Jawad? Wafat al kabul who's Musa al kabul the rest of the year, you don't even see her. She comes in Muharram and Ramadan. She's obeying her, her parents' wishes that she's got to come. She covers herself because of... And so therefore, it's not necessarily the greatest hijab just because there is a covering of the face. And as I said, um, it, is, uh, it is not wajib in anyone's rasal, if I'm not mistaken, that the face all has to be covered. As for the second point about the relativity of beauty, I agree. You know, some of us will find certain things beautiful, others don't. The philosophy behind hijab is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the laws he uh, makes are according to the laws of nature. So what you find is that Allah creates everything in pairs. Find the sun and the moon are created in pairs. So Yasin gives you a classic explanation of how the, uh, the sun cannot overtake the timings of the moon, and the moon cannot overtake the timings of the sun. They are in like a proper orbit. You find that the sun and the earth were created as a pair, 150 million kilometers. I'm sure this union is better than my union science. 150 million kilometers between the sun and the earth. I think if it goes any further, then we will uh, freeze. And if it gets any closer, we will burn. So those are created in pairs. The plant world, male and female. And I think asexual reproduction, if I'm going back to the GCS, I was awful in science, honestly. In the plant world. And then animal, male and female. Even the animal recognizes you have to have a partner that's female. Anyway, so here you have the animal that has the male and female. And then you have the human being. And uh, you have the human being, male and female, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for each of the pairs has created certain laws which they must follow in order that the pairs uh, achieve happiness in their life. If these laws between male and female are not followed, you will find the billboards written on it, sex in the city. You will find another one written on it, desperate housewives. You will find, yes, uh, Mrs. Campbell is suing because of what? Because someone accuses of taking drugs. Or um, another one is uh, suing because someone is accused of drinking too much. Or Sadie Frost uh, swaps Jude Law and Jude Law goes with another woman. And before you know it, because these laws are not being observed, havoc is caused in society. I don't know if you read an article in the... Alright, it, uh, it's not in that newspaper, but I'll make up a paper. The Times! Yes, it was in a different one with a red cover. Anyway, it was in the Times. And uh, there was an article about wife swapping. You know, uh, Jude Law, the actor, he's with a girl at the moment called Sienna Miller, I think. And uh, Sadie Frost has just gone with uh, another guy. And they all live in... This is on... You have to understand these concepts. This is Primrose Hill. You know Primrose Hill? We just park at the end. Now, in Primrose Hill, there's all this thing about wife swapping going on now. That Sadie Frost says Jude Law was sleeping with another and she was with someone else. Why? We're talking about relativity. I agree. But relativity has... There is a law which Allah has set... This law is not for one individual, it's for the whole of society. So the whole of society has to observe these laws in order that chaos does not occur in society. 
For me, she may be beautiful, but that other one isn't. So the other one, uh, the, um, you know, he may find um, a different combination as being beautiful. But Allah has set the law of hijab in order that mankind can achieve spiritual happiness in his life. If the law of hijab is not looked after, you will find exactly what's going on in the world today. That I've always said, I said in one of my lectures in Sydney, that if sexual, sexual energy can cause destruction in society, and that Imam Zayn al abidin says that on their way to Karbala, his father would always remind the companions of the story of um, Nabi Yahya. You know Nabi Yahya, he was uh, killed because he went against the king's wishes. So sexual energy can cause destruction. If we do not follow the laws that have been prescribed, like the sister said in a great point, which was, I needed to know someone who could tell me what's right and wrong, and not everyone give their opinion. And she mentioned Nietzsche, and Nietzsche, of course, he, he, he went crazy at the end. Because Nietzsche couldn't understand the, the, the fight between faith and freedom until eventually it caused Nietzsche to go in a, in, a, in a world of delirium and he didn't know what he was doing at the end. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he's setting the law of hijab, yes, there are certain individuals who may have other characteristics, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not setting the law for the individual, he's setting the law for the whole. Can I say something about that? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, I remember one book I was reading. It was said, um, one man was giving advice for women how to be attractive. And he was saying that you're crazy if you think that your legs or your shoulders will do a good job anymore because people are already, they, they fed up with it. Yeah? You have to come up with, um, with something original. So try to wear a black dress up to your um, chin, all covered, no slits, nothing. Only without sleeves, only your hands. And I can assure you that all men would follow you all evening. So the thing is, um, it, you, you were very right saying that it's very objective what is attractive, what is not. And since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us, He created our, um, our nervous system, how we work, our physical, um, uh, all our reaction. And He knows better what will attract, what is attractive. And He is the best judge. So once He te tells you what is attractive and what you should cover and what you should leave, so you wouldn't have any problems, and you know that. Because he knows his creation, because he is a creator. Uh, we've got quite a few questions here, just uh, to the audience about um, how well, obviously, Mashallah defined the uh, woman's responsibility. But if you'd like to clarify a bit more male's responsibility in terms of his head up, not just lowering the gaze. Sure. <coughs> well, of course, the lowering of the gaze is the. Uh, is the most well known, but I also go even further to talking about the hijab of the of the male as being the beard. Why? Abu Abdullah al Hussein, when he's got uh, Ali Asghar in his in his hands, and he asks for the water, okay, and he says to them, "Please give him some water." He's only six months old. No one replies. He then puts him on the ground. No one replies. He then lifts him one more time. Harmala's arrow pierces the neck at that moment. He is narrated in the hadith to have taken the blood and washed, you know, put the blood on his beard. If you believe Abu Abdullah al Hussein is purified both physically and spiritually, then the whole concept of clean shaven goes out of the window because the embodiment of cleanliness is Hussein ibn Ali. The West gives you the idea that clean shaven. You have to be, you know, if you're, if you're shaven completely, that means you're clean. Whereas on the contrary, Imam Hussein and every single one of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt had a beard. Yes, we know that some of us in some cases, if we put a beard, it may not suit us. Okay? That maybe, maybe in some cases, a girl may be more attracted towards a guy who's clean shaven than a guy who has a beard. But that is the test we have to face. The test is that we have to grow a beard of a certain length which identifies us as males in the world and identifies our hijab. So I would go further from lowering the gaze, I would also go towards the, the point of uh, the hijab. And the third area, now in many of your, in, uh, I remember in my day, uh, now only a couple of years ago, Arab societies, yes, you still have them at uni, Arab societies? Okay, it's a good excuse to meet another guy um, or meet another girl. Uh, in the Arab societies, what happens is that the guy comes, I remember there was one event which I was told about, they, they read Quran at the beginning, and even though about 60% was made up of brothers from the Christian faith, they, met, they read Quran in the beginning, and then suddenly all the socializing occurred. This girl speaking with that guy, and this guy speaking with this girl, and everyone goes, no, she's my classmate at you, we're not going to do nothing wrong. Now the problem is here, yes, you may not do something wrong, but I can tell you stories 
which we have to sort out when the parents come to us and say, I'm like, you're right, you know, there's a, there's a problem and so on. Can you please come and help us out, have a word with the guy? What's the problem? Well, he meets her in this Arab society and he's like, uh, he's gone there because he's saying, we're raising money for Iraq, like Iraq needs money from Haram gatherings. Okay, so he goes, yes, we needed to go there. And before you know it, he's met my daughter. They were laughing. Then always a laugh means uh, what well, goes on to a text. And the text goes on to a phone call, and then after that you're in trouble. And what happens is, from these gatherings, some guys have to recognize their hijab is not to attend gatherings like this. Because gatherings like this have no space whatsoever in the religion of Islam. There's a concept of acquaintance, and there's a concept of a friend. I may be acquainted with you at university. Obviously, I'm not going to come into a lecture theater, see a girl sitting next to me and say, you know, not speak with her, I will ask her, how are you, how's everything, how's your studies. The moment I go into, where did you go shopping last night, I'm, I'm going into, you know, Dangerous territory. You would agree. So in these Arab society events, we're all kidding ourselves when we're saying, Oh, well, well I'm not going to speak with a guy, or I'm not going to speak with... You're kidding yourself. The girl's sitting over there, you've had your eye on her for about half an hour. You think you're not going to be sitting... Oh, as soon as she comes, you suddenly see them go all nervous, yes? Relax. What's wrong with you? You don't have to act like that. You should be the one who they should all come to. Only joke. Um, another question here for Sister Bayer. Um, how should one approach a non-Muslim to change their attitude towards a uh, Muslim woman's hijab? What would you advise? Um, well, I don't think you should approach anyhow with the thing, you know why I'm wearing hijab? That's not because of I'm bad words or because of I'm forced by parents, that's because of my choice. No, because um, the thing why I was attracted to Islam that nobody tried to force me to think of anything. I just saw, I was just observer and um, just your behavior would speak much louder than all your words. And sooner or later you would be asked about your hijab. Sooner or later you would be asked, so what's the point? What, what is the reason? Especially if you're a friend of somebody. And uh, I wouldn't advise to talk, especially talk about that, or about religion, or about asking, so what do you believe in? Do you believe in Allah? Why don't you believe in Allah? It's so obvious. It's, it should be in your heart. So, of course, not such a um, talk. And I think if person is interested, he would ask anyway. And um, as I said, your behavior would be much, um, much louder than any words. Um, another question from the So the other one, okay. Uh, as for the part of uh, speaking, because maybe I'm in that area, I encourage you so, so much to come out and speak in public, as much as you can. Of course, the hijab is very important, that's when you come out, you are representing the whole of that particular school, okay. So come out and speak, we need, you see in the area of lecturing around the world today, English speakers, you may have, you know, you can click on the internet to maybe find five, six renowned English speakers. Um, when it comes to female English speakers, it's very hard to find uh, renowned female English speakers. I, I probably would know uh, Najat Bazzi in Michigan as one of the renowned English speakers, and maybe some of you wouldn't, wouldn't even have heard of her. Or you may find uh, Sister Omul Banin at uh, Stanmore, renowned English speaker. But then after that, you're going here, then you're not finding many renowned English uh, speakers. So I encourage you so highly. And as I said with Sayyidah Zainab, look at how she came out. The most unbelievable talk. And I'll tell you what, there is a moment when Ubaidullah bin Ziyad, when he, uh, he says, MashaAllah, you are very eloquent in the way you're talking, trying to ridicule her. She replies, if I wanted to be eloquent, you and no one here would be able to survive my Arabic. I'm just giving you a chance so you can understand. So say the same, if she wants to, she Fatima al Zahra, when um, our good friend stole her rights, yes, uh, she of course uh, spoke out and she brought the verses which spoke out about, their, uh, about her rights. And you notice that a female comes out and speaks. This is the verses. Dawood uh, Sulaiman, Zakaria Yahya, inheritance, neither cavalry, nor cam uh, neither cavalry nor camelry. As for the Quran, the speech about Fedek and what happened is one of the most unbelievable speeches. So uh, even Yazid's wife 
Hind came out and gave a speech when she saw Sayyidah Zainab. She asked, who is this lady? And they told her Sayyidah Zainab she could not believe it. And she came out and gave a talk about seeing Fatima the Zahra in her dream and saying, how could we now be playing with the lips of Abu Abdullah? So come out and speak as much as you can. Okay, trust me, there's good money. I mean, good thawab before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, about the interaction with the opposite sex, um, um, I think there are like three lights, green, yellow, red, and, um, and um, three kind of topics which you can talk. One is particularly about job, about study, uh, when is um, our test, when is exam, what is about the job, and yeah. Another one is purely leisure one, yeah. Um, and it's neutral one. So this is yellow uh, light, which you shouldn't even approach, because this is safer, which you can, yeah, but you shouldn't. So, and especially girls, I think they know, um, once their voice becomes soft and nice, that's, that's red light, this is alert. So um, I agree with brother, who encouraged you to come out, to speak, to to declare yourself as a thinking, as a clever, as a modest and modern woman at the same time, who can be um, significant for society and at the same time wear hijab. So for that, of course, you have to talk. Of course, you, have to, you can't avoid um, communicating with opposite sex. But you can avoid these kind of things, which asking like, oh, okay, how was your holiday? And uh, um, let's talk about that. What did you read, what did you read last uh, weekend? And things um, which goes towards the yellow light. That's my opinion, and I think, I think personally that that's right. Shall I answer this one first, and then? Uh, just, just the question here, apart from political ones, are there any negative effects of wearing hijab if you want to live in London today, i.e. psychological ones? Uh, don't get me wrong, I can't actually, however much I try to explain hijab to you, textbook explanation and so on, I can never face what you face on an everyday basis. You know, I can't. You must face pressures when you're on the train, on the bus, which I have never seen and I, you know, I can never understand in my life. Uh, so, of course, there are, there are pressures, negative effects. I think if you wear your hijab, the hijab can be used, you know, you can wear your hijab so elegantly that you can psychologically be so relaxed with your hijab. You know, these days you see, you know, Pradas make hijab, Louis Vuitton's make hijab, you know, Gucci's make hijab. So what? Why not wear hijab with elegance? Yes, wear the, the most elegance of hijab. Feel relaxed. Okay, psychologically, you can only psychologically bring yourself down. But otherwise, you should feel relaxed when you're wearing hijab. And feel in honor of the hijab that you're wearing. As for political ones, of course, what happened in France was, was trouble for us, you know. Uh, but at least we all spoke out in unity. And alhamdulillah, I don't think this country, well not, a, not yet anyway, but this country has recognized because of the cosmopolitan nature of London, especially that hijab is quite accepted in London these days. Although I know when you go further in the Midlands and up north, there are certain areas which are a bit um, dangerous. But as I said, psychologically, you know, come out and just be confident in yourself. Okay, we'll take the final question. friend is not someone who makes you laugh, it's someone who makes you cry, in the sense that uh, he's the one who will come and tell you when you're doing something wrong. I see many Zainabs today, but how many of them actually appreciate what that lady went through from the 10th until the 40th, and after the 40th, you know, it, it's far and few between, and it is your role in the world of Amr bin Ma'ruf and Nahi Ali Munkar to actually give the advice. But I think actions speak louder than words sometimes. If she sees your hijab is very good, she will see you. If truly you are a friend and an advisor and a role model, she herself will be drawn in towards you. But if you have a sort of hypocrisy, that's one minute, for example, when we're going in Muhammad, we're wearing the hijab. And the next minute when we're back, up, old hijab, she's going to be wondering, hold on, you're telling me when you yourself can't master it on the 3 5 24 7. So, you know, I think actions become the words. Of course, it's your role to make sure that the advice is given. And how you do it, always try and relate them back to your author and try and make her feel that, you know, if you truly love her, then act, you know, try and act in the way she acts. to say that. I think we'd like to thank both the uh, speakers for brilliant and really inspiring talks. And uh, once again, for that, some artists. Wow!